So good morning, everybody. My name is Shirley Pockenance and welcome to the Friday Sam Seminar. Before introducing our speaker, please allow me to go over some house rules. Please make use of the chat to post questions to the speaker. Questions will be answered after the talk and there will be an opportunity to ask live questions after the presentation. Please remain muted for the duration of the presentation. And please note that the presentation will be recorded and added to the SEAN YouTube page. So today is my pleasure to introduce Atli Kile. He is an NRF Research and Innovation Support and Advancement Professional Development Program doctorate candidate conducting research on foraminiferal deposits on floodplains at the University, Nelson Mandela University through SEAN L1 Clay Coastal Note from the Ocean Sciences Campus in Port Elizabeth. Ati became, began his career with SEAN as a DST NRF GIS intern in 2012. This introduced him to the estuarine ecology, looking at the effects of global climate change and related impacts on the distribution of salt marsh vegetation. This cultivated a keen interest in understanding environmental drivers responsible for the development and distribution of salt marshes. Subsequently, his master's investigated the influence of sediment in hydrological processes on the distribution of Spartana maritima intertidal salt marshes in Kierbohm's history. He is currently busy with a doctorate looking at sediment deposits to investigate the occurrence and reoccurrence of paleo extreme marine wave evidence along the, along the South African coast with a strong emphasis on tsunamis. He has received training on the identification of grain microtextual signatures at the University of Lisbon in Portugal and the identification of foraminiferal assemblages at the International School of Foraminiferal Studies at the University, University of Urbino in Italy. His work at El Wantle includes assisting in long-term ecological research, looking at the response of selected histories to rising sea levels using rod surface, surface elevation tables or R sets. Today, Ati will tell us a bit more on his research looking at irregular sediment deposits preserved in the stratigraphic record of the Swartkops estuary and low-lying Dwarskars box coastal plain. He uses foraminiferal assemblages as proxy to identify and interpret past extreme marine inundation events in these contrasting environments along the South African coast. So without any further delay, let's hear from Ati. Ati, please unmute yourself. Yeah. You're muted. Thank you. There okay. you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, good morning to everyone, and uh, thanks for joining me in this presentation. And uh, let me first uh, uh, apologize for last week, as I had some terrible connections uh, with my laptop. Finally, we are here now. Well, I will be presenting uh, some of my work that I'm doing on Forum Nifera. So I just chose this title because uh, uh, Forum Nifera research is something new uh, to me and also I'll say to uh, us as the Scion uh, Research Institution. So uh, I am uh, supervised by uh, Tommy Bonman and also Hayley Kotra. Uh, who, are, uh, who are unfortunately not joining us today. Maybe Shelly might join us. Uh, well, I'll be, uh, my, um, my presentation is structured uh, in uh, four ways whereby I'll be giving you an introduction of what foraminiferal are and uh, how they are uh, uh, classified and uh, how they are utilized in the uh, uh, climate change uh, research. And then I'll go to the research methods of um, my project with a, a short intro on how we collected the sediment and how we also uh, analyze these forums. And then I'll give you a primal results on the sedimentological uh, signatures and then forums. And then I'll close it with my conclusion. 
Okay, let's go to what foraminiferals are. Well, uh, foraminiferal, uh, they are a single uh, celled micro uh, organisms with a shell test that is either made up of a uh, calcium carbonate or silica or organic matter. Some of them, uh, they build their uh, body or walls with a foreign uh, uh, substrate such as sand or maybe uh, whatever material they find. Like for instance, uh, here, uh, here I show uh, how these uh, groups of uh, forums and like uh, the types of uh, the specimen. So uh, this is uh, the type of uh, the ones that uh, they make their uh, body with the uh, foreign substrate such as uh, sand grains. And then I have these two most common uh, types of which uh, this one, uh, it will be those ones that uh, they are made up of silica and calcium carbonate together with those ones that we call the uh, haline. So basically uh, these uh, uh, forms of uh, forums, when you zoomed at their body, you'll find that uh, they are built in a block-like shape uh, material whereby uh, they protect them from uh, breakage when there is some sort of a violent uh, wave or violent, uh, a violent uh, transformation. So here, these are the uh, pieces that we found in this uh, research of which uh, all of them we have found uh, those ones that uh, they are made up of uh, carbonate shell, organic and silicon, and also those that they are made up of uh, a sand grain. Well, uh, where do they live? That was the question as to where do they live? Uh, for Amiferal, unlike uh, diatoms, they are found exclusively in marine environments. So basically they live on or in the sediment surface of the sea floor, or maybe uh, in the uh, estuarine environment. And they are either attached to a rock or seaweed or in seagrass. Well, basically here you will find that uh, this is a schematic uh, um, a graph of uh, where do they live. So basically you, you will find them uh, floating in the water column, which are those that we call the uh, uh, planktonics uh, foraminiferals. And then those ones that uh, they, they live within the sediments, we call them uh, benthic, of which there are plenty uh, of them, that those ones that they live in sediments. So uh, they uh, uh, then uh, you'll find them living uh, in different uh, depths uh, from uh, uh, salt marshes to the uh, deeper waters. Well, of course, uh, as much as they live within the sediment, you'll find them uh, in different depths, uh, which they will vary from place to place. When they are dead, all of them, they will uh, be preserved as a fossil uh, in the bottom of the seafloor or or in the uh, estuarine environment. So for instance, here in these uh, pictures, these are the examples of uh, the types of forum. So the one and two, in fact, one is the one that you found them in estuarine environments, whereas uh, two and three, you found them in the coastal shelf, whereas number four, uh, it is an example of planktonics um, forums whereby they have uh, this bubbles uh, shape which uh, helps them to flow within the water column. The evolution of uh, uh, these uh, species, uh, it dates back roughly about uh, 5 million years ago, and uh, they are, uh, they are over 600,000 fossilized and living species that have been uh, 
identified. However, today there are only around about uh, 8,000 that are living, uh, 40 of which they are uh, planktonics. So there are very few uh, planktonic species that are living today compared to the uh, benthic species. So this is just a generalized uh, picture of uh, when did they first uh, appeared in the history of uh, the Earth. Well, the principle of their classification, first, it is based on the, first of all, as I said, uh, we have a benthic and also Plantonic. So that is the first principle as to how do we uh, classify them. And then we go to the chamber arrangement. So these are the type of chambers that uh, we have in the foraminiferal uh, uh, species. So you will have a single chamber, you will have the unicellular uh, 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 chambers, and then you have the uh, bi and also a uh, tricellular uh, uh, chambers. And then you'll have uh, this one that we call at number six, uh, they are myelolith uh, species. So they have uh, different chambers as well. Uh, they'll have uh, many chambers from uh, two to maybe five to six chambers. And then we have uh, some that uh, they are calling uh, from an exit, which is uh, those ones at number eight. And then how do we identify? First, let me just show you an example of uh, the chamber arrangement. So these two, uh, they show us uh, uh, an example of the uh, bicereal and also triceral chambers. And so this uh, number one is uh, this is a species of Bolivia, whereas number two it is a species of uh, uh, Ulimina species. And then again we go to the number of chambers. Like for instance, uh, these uh, two uh, pictures, it shows us uh, the species that uh, they have uh, different chambers. Uh, well, as much as uh, they are different, uh, what is important in these uh, species, it is the number of chambers. Like for instance, uh, number three and four, they are calling from an exit, but uh, in order for us to uh, differentiate between these two, we have to count the number of chambers. Uh, like for instance, these two, they are the species of ammonia, but they are different species. Uh, this one, this one, it will be uh, the species of uh, ammonia petavus based on number of chambers. Uh, whereas this one is going to be the ammonia tabita, which has less chambers. Another important uh, 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 character that we need to also uh, look at it uh, with these species is going to be the presence of umbilical plug. So basically as much maybe you won't be seeing it clearly, this one, it will have a plug, whereas this one, it won't have the plug. So that is uh, one of the principle of uh, classifying these uh, uh, two species. And then we will go to their value in uh, the ecological research or uh, climate research. Well, of course, uh, foraminiferal, they are controlled by a variety of uh, biotic and uh, abiotic conditions that are acting in that area, such as the temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and nutrient flux, sedimentology, and also the uh, current flow, whereas uh, the biotic factors are going to be the food uh, availability, predictors, inter- and uh, intraspecific uh, competition. So basically, uh, those pieces that uh, some of them uh, I showed you earlier on, you'll find that uh, they won't be occurring in high salinity zone, or when for instance uh, the conditions changes, uh, you will find that uh, they will also uh, change in their 
are burning. So, so hence uh, the individual species, they will occupy a specific environmental niche based on uh, these factors. Well, of course, this makes them very useful uh, in the biological studies. Like for instance, uh, if we are looking at uh, the ecological health of the uh, environment, we'll be looking at the live vessels, at uh, dead species, and also their diversity. And again, uh, they are fossilized species. They are uh, useful in paleo environmental reconstruction, such as the sea level uh, reconstruction uh, uh, studies. Whereas if we are looking at dating, uh, they are very uh, useful because uh, even after that, they can uh, be well preserved, which make them very useful in giving us a uh, precise uh, dating compared to the reworked shells. And then uh, in some, uh, in some uh, areas, uh, uh, the fossil of Porumpera has been useful in the uh, in the oil exploration, of which uh, they can give us an idea of whether we we'll have uh, or whether we have some oil reserved. As uh, when uh, they are dead, they go and uh, sit in the sea floor, which, uh, of which uh, they become a fossil, which is a, a good indicator of whether we'll have a oil reserve. So here I put this picture of process to just show you when process we are looking at the alive vessel dead for um, a So when they are alive, they will be, uh, uh, when uh, they are alive, we will stay in them with rose Bengal. So when they are alive, they will be a, a, a pink, whereas it, when we've collected them dead, they won't be a staining pink. So this is um, one of the methods that, um, we, uh, 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 that is used when we are looking at um, live vessels dead species. Well, again, uh, then again, uh, AI importance has been uh, recognized in the science of uh, uh, extreme marine events where they've been utilized uh, to interpret uh, the evidence of uh, extreme marine events such as uh, tsunamis and storms, whereby we use uh, their assemblage and also their, uh, their typonomical uh, character. So basically, uh, we'll look at whether we have marine versus estuarine uh, species. And when we're looking at their, at their breakage uh, character, we'll look at, at um, uh, are they uh, uh, fragmented, corroded, or unaltered. So I just put these uh, pictures from uh, one of the study that was investigating uh, tsunami at the posing. So basically, these green ones, uh, they are not fragmented, but uh, they are indicator species because um, these on our uh, right hand side, uh, they are found in deep marine environment and also these uh, uh, on our uh, uh, bottom left side, they are found in the deep marine environment. So to find them in one area with these ones, they are mostly found in shallow in shallow environment. It will tell us that uh, there is an event that uh, it transported them and deposited them in those environments that are not usually found uh, to be uh, living in. And then another uh, 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 thing that they look at uh, it is the breakage, which is uh, these ones, breakage and corroded. You can see the red ones, and uh, they are fragmented, whereas uh, those uh, yellowish ones, uh, they are corroded, which is, um, it is the combination of, of corrosion and abrasion. So basically, uh, they were also 
well, uh, these ones, uh, it shows that uh, they were uh, transported uh, by a violent wave event. So these are the main uh, character that is used to to uh, to interpret and identify extreme marine events. However, as much as uh, they are useful in looking back in time and also to look at the extreme events, uh, it is very important that uh, uh, we identify indicative pieces so that uh, we'll be able uh, uh, to refer uh, to whether these um, they have been um, uh, transported from a deeper environment. So we need to have a modern uh, knowledge of where do they live, what uh, uh, kind of environment do they uh, prefer. And then just a brief uh, a summary of uh, what has been done so far in the South African context. Well, uh, there is a sort of uh, research on foreign fire along the South African coastline. Uh, the earlier studies of foreign fire that are reported, uh, they date back in the uh, 1800s uh, by uh, 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 these authors. And uh, below, uh, these are the species that uh, you will find uh, in the USL uh, website uh, that are reportedly uh, uh, collected from the South African coastline. So all these, they are, uh, uh, they are planktonic species of which uh, I think they were collected within uh, the uh, offshore sites. So I'm not too sure where exactly, because they are not uh, mentioned as to where. And then uh, there after this research, and uh, there has been some research that has been conducted uh, investigating the paleo environmental conditions of selected uh, localities along the uh, east coast and also the southeast coast and also along the west coast uh, there is also some research uh, that uh, provides a good account uh, of taxonomy and also the factors that uh, affect their uh, geographical distribution along those uh, uh, at that uh, coastline Whereas recently, there's also some work um, by Thrachen, uh, who has been using a uh, foreign material as a proxy to uh, reconstruct a Holocene sea level history along the southeast coast. Well, uh, these studies, uh, they are important uh, uh, in giving us a baseline data through which uh, we can reference uh, our work that we currently doing because, like for instance, uh, we will, like for instance, we won't be able uh, to tell as to which kind of species that uh, they are uh, found in South Africa if we don't have data that uh, reports these species along the south uh, along the South African coast. So they are very vital in giving us uh, baseline data. Well, I'll go to the uh, research aim and objectives of uh, this current work. Well, uh, this current work that, we, uh, uh, that we're doing, uh, we're, uh, we are looking at the uh, evidence of tsunami and related deposits along uh, the South African coast. So basically we've selected these sites. So we have sites along the Southeast coast in Swartbox and also in Chrome and uh, in uh, Galbios and in Flatenden Bay, Bay in Kiribums. And then we also selected some sites along the south, uh, 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 the west coast in the uh, St. Helena Bay, in the Bag uh, River Estuary, and also in uh, Duarte's Coast and uh, Ferradon Clay in uh, Ellen's Bay. Well, for this research, as I said, uh, we'll be looking at Forum Nafar assemblage as proxy to uh, reconstruct a uh, paleo extreme marine events. So basically these are the sites uh, that we've collected a uh, cause from the Swarkov's uh, estuary. But for this research, I'll be focusing on uh, this site, which is uh, SC3 core. 
uh, in the Swarkovs. And then along the uh, Dwarfkis Falls area, we've collected three calls. Uh, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to uh, sample as many calls there because uh, that area, it is built now, it is a, a built village. Uh, and, and also it is worth to mention that uh, this area is one of the areas uh, that uh, are known to have uh, been hit by at least two tsunami-like waves in 1969 and also in 2008. So we selected uh, these uh, sampling area based on the uh, paper that was written uh, in 2014 by um, these uh, uh, by these uh, authors. So we'll be uh, presenting data from uh, DC1 that is in the lower part of the uh, Dwarfkis Falls. Well, of course, we collected these calls using the uh, P uh, uh, PVC impact coring, which is one of the uh, standard coring uh, methods that is used, uh, used uh, worldwide. Well, uh, the calls were split uh, longitudinally in half and photographed in the lab after we've collected. And uh, we've logged the calls for the uh, logical units in terms of the sedimentary uh, color and texture, the sediment structures such as shell segments and uh, the plant uh, remains. And thereafter, the uh, samples um, uh, were, uh, were collected for a grain size, organic matter. And also, so uh, this is just to show how we. Uh, we are doing uh, this first um, uh, sedimentary analysis. And then we go to the foraminophile uh, analysis. So here we, uh, so here we collect uh, at least uh, 10 uh, uh, cubic centimeter subsamples uh, in selected uh, units at three centimeter interval. So, so uh, this core here it shows us uh, how we uh, how we are subsampling at the core. So within that uh, specific uh, core units, and then uh, thereafter we will soak the sediment uh, in um, in uh, tap water, and then uh, we will sieve it uh, through a uh, one three five five, one two five, and uh, sixty microns, and then uh, we only. Uh, dry the the uh, remaining that uh, is at 125 and 63 micron on the uh, oven and uh, thereafter we'll only be picking the segment from the 125 uh, micron at least 100 uh, specimen uh, we aim to count and identify uh, using uh, this literature well, uh, the foreign feral uh, are uh, 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 identified to a species level of which uh, there are only, in fact, uh, three uh, groups that uh, we are uh, uh, able to uh, identify up to a species level, which are, are the species of ammonia and also uh, the species of alphidium. So these are the examples of uh, these uh, two groups that we are able to uh, identify to a species level. And then some that we are only uh, identify up to, to the genus level. Part of the reason we are doing that is because of um, uh, the character of this, uh, 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 their preservation and also um, uh, they are breakage. So some of them we are not able to uh, identify to species level because of the breakage or maybe a uh, corroded or maybe a uh, fossilization, which means that they are not so well preserved. So thereafter, after we have uh, identified, we also uh, characterize these species to, uh, uh, for the uh, typhonomal uh, conditions that is uh, unaltered, corroded, and also fragmentation. So these uh, species, uh, they show these three uh, characterization. The one, uh, the number one species is going to be 
uh, unaltered, the number two is going to be corroded, and the number three is going to be fragmented. Okay, I'll just give you a brief uh, results of our course uh, uh, sedimentological uh, characteristics of our course. So these are the course that uh, we've selected, uh, we've collected from the uh, SWAR groups. So as you can see here, you can see it from my left hand side. So this is my legend as to um, what is happening here within a specific core. As you could see in these uh, red um, a unit. So these red units, they are basically the units that uh, we've uh, uh, we've uh, selected to uh, analyze a foreign thermal uh, assembly. So basically, uh, these units, that's where we found them that uh, they are uh, poorly sorted and coarse in nature uh, with an evidence of a, a massive shell fragments, uh, which vary in different um, a thickness, like for instance, at uh, the at uh, the uh, S three, the one that uh, we will be uh, focusing on, the first unit there, which we think that uh, it was deposited by an extreme marine event, it is a uh, six centimeter thick uh, in terms of the uh, uh, shell fragment. When the, uh, whereas the one at the base, it is a uh, eight centimeter thick of a uh, shell at uh, deposit. And then just to show you our uh, grain size, like I said, our grain size of uh, these units, uh, this is the unit from uh, 73 to 76, which shows us a uh, very a uh, coarse and a uh, poorly sorted uh, sand uh, uh, deposits. As I said, uh, the uh, thickness is six uh, centimeter fragments of uh, 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 shells. Well, uh, this coal, and uh, we've dated this coal using the lead uh, 210 uh, dating, would give us a sedimentation rate of 2.2 millimeters per year. Well, uh, when we are uh, trying to uh, calculate the years, assuming that the rate um, of the sedimentation remained uh, constant throughout the years, it will give us uh, 318 years up to uh, this uh, unit, uh, which will give us roughly about um, 17,000 years. Year. So, that means that uh, this uh, unit, it was deposited around uh, that year, but we are not too sure as to whether uh, this is uh, precise because uh, we are uh, making a big assumption to say that if uh, the, uh, sed uh, the uh, sedimentation rate remained constant, then that unit will be deposited around uh, 1700. And then go to the uh, Dwarfkis force. Again, in Dwarfkis force, in the uh, course that we've collected there, the three cores, we have these uh, uh, units. Well, the first units, which is uh, this one, uh, uh, these ones at the top, it also showed uh, some coarse grain uh, nature, but, uh, but uh, it is not clear as to whether this one uh, it, it was deposited by uh, an extreme marine event because uh, this unit is not present in that uh, first core, but in the second uh, 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 unit, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, find all these uh, uh, second uh, units in all the cores, which uh, they vary in uh, grain size. So, and again, we go to the last one we also, find uh, these uh, uh, three, uh, 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 three units in all the three cores. So we'll be focusing in this uh, BC1, whereby uh, 
the green uh, uh, arrows they uh, they showed the units that will be presenting the uh, foraminifera. And then also to just give you a brief uh, result of uh, the uh, grain size. This is the second uh, unit that uh, I've just explained in the C1. So whereby we see um, the um, coarse yellow sand. Uh, there's also some flat plow shell uh, underneath uh, that uh, a unit there, which suggests uh, an extreme marine event because uh, this shell uh, is mostly found in a, a deep uh, um, surf zone. Well, again, this area that uh, we've collected this coal, this is an area that is reportedly not to have been flooded during the 1969 Dwarf Force event. So it uh, uh, gave us something to think about it as to if or since that area was not flooded at uh, that time of the event. So the question is that uh, we have to ask ourselves where, when did this uh, a unit that is also consistent with other coals was deposited? Was it deposited by a normal a wave or by an, an extreme marine events, maybe a tsunami of those two separate events, or maybe or maybe an earlier event. So again, we also find uh, that a third unit at the base, whereby it also caused in a, a nature with a very poorly sorted with some uh, evidence of shell fragments as much as the shell fragments in these uh, cores from the Dwarfkirk cores, they are not as massive as in uh, the Swarthcopes samples. Well, now it takes us to the foraminiferal assemblage that uh, we have identified so far in the uh, in these cores. Well, the, uh, the assemblage that uh, we uh, 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 that we have identified in these calls. In total, there are 1,834 feral species that have been counted, identified uh, corresponding to 50 species and uh, 43 genera. Well, generally, in Swarkovs, we, uh, we have found a higher number of species than uh, the uh, Dwarfkirk spores. Well, in this plot, well, I would like to apologize about my uh, uh, color scheme. I was trying to maybe try to uh, present some of the uh, species that we found in these uh, areas. So as you can see here, you can see that uh, we have this short building in this uh, 50 to 53 centimeter. Uh, a unit well uh, that are the species that we have identified so we could in a a pick a hundred species compared to uh, the uh, uh, other uh, units so basically here in this a uh, unit the species of ammonia they were the uh, domain species but however uh, we have found um, a high number of inner shelf and also the, the uh, planktonic forms that were consistently occurring in uh, 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 these samples, especially in at uh, the 70 to 73 centimeter and also 73 uh, 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 to 76. These are the units uh, that uh, I showed you earlier on, the one that we think it was supported by an extreme marine event. Well, Again, in terms of their preservation, well, we suspect that uh, as much as uh, we found all these uh, uh, diverse species from the uh, open marine to the estuarine assemblage, but in terms of uh, their uh, preservation, they were high preserved and unaltered. As you can see here, 
in this graph, it shows us uh, those uh, three uh, characteristics, uh, corroded, fragmented, and also unaltered. As you can see that um, more than 50% of the species are, are unaltered, whereas well, there is a sizable amount of uh, the uh, fragmentation and corroded. And then again, we go to the second unit still in the uh, Swarkovs. You can see here there is a similar assemblage compared when we compare to the uh, previous units, whereby we found that uh, the ammonia species it is the dominant species. However, we also see another dominant species, uh, Pararotalia, which became the second uh, dominant group. And again, we also found inner shelf species such as cypacytes that were prominent along with the myloliths, whereas lanthanides they were occasionally occurring, especially in this base unit at 124 to 129. A centimeter. Well, again, again, there in terms of uh, they are um, alteration, corroded, fragmented. There are very few species that uh, they were uh, fragmented compared to the species that uh, they were uh, unaltered in this uh, unit. And then we go to the uh, Dwarskis post assemblage. Well, as I said earlier on, in the Dwarskis post samples, uh, we found uh, very few species. Only uh, 18 species were, uh, were identified in the uh, Dwarskis post. However, similar to for the uh, Swarkops, ammonia specimen was a dominant species. However, we found that uh, another inner shelf a group, Alphidium uh, species, were consistently occurring, indicating uh, that uh, they were from uh, the marine uh, environment. Well, in terms of uh, the okay, before uh, I can go to the character of um, of uh, fragmentation unfragmented you can see here as i said that uh, they, the the uh, target is to uh, identify at least 100 specimens you can see here in one sample we didn't even uh, reach 50 species so this is roughly about i think it's a uh, 27 uh, uh, count that we were able to count whereas in other we found 100 and then we drop again uh, into maybe 73 uh, species that uh, we were able uh, to uh, count here. So this is the group that is dominant, which is the ammonia group, and then followed um, by uh, by uh, alphidium group there uh, with that color. And then in terms of typhonomy, uh, this unit uh, was dominated by the uh, fragmentation uh, species, roughly about 30 to 58 percent of the um, specimen uh, was fragmented. So this, so just uh, here below, uh, it shows us uh, the uh, these species that uh, were mostly fragmented. Uh, these are the, the same uh, 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 group. Alphidium crispin that is found in the uh, inner shelf. And then again, in the second unit, which is the lower unit. So that one that I just presented, it was that a second unit at about um, 45 to 70 centimeters. And then down the core at around about uh, 80, at 96 uh, to 108. So again, uh, this is the, the lower unit of uh, that core, whereby uh, we found that uh, there are two 
indicator species that are still dominant ammonia and uh, alphidia. However, in terms of uh, their uh, abundance, there are only uh, three species that uh, we could uh, identify there, which is ammonia, alphidia, and uh, parotalia. And again, you can see here, we were like, uh, we were not even able to reach 10 accounts in some uh, uh, unit. Whereas the, the uh, highest unit that we're able to count uh, many species is only the lower unit, which we counted 22 species a uh, day. And uh, when you also look at the level of um, the uh, fragmentation, it has dropped compared to the uh, previous unit. Uh, it was mostly uh, dominated by the uh, corroded specimen with roughly about uh, 38 to 71 percent of the specimen were corroded. So these are the uh, examples of the species that we could uh, identify or uh, we picked it there. So these are the uh, alphidium uh, species, whereas this one is ammonia species, which we are not able to uh, identify to a species level because it's fragmented. We cannot count the, at the chambers. We cannot see whether it has a, a milk out plug or not. So this will be um, the type of species that will um, uh, classify as either corroded or uh, fragmented. Well, so that was more or less of uh, um, our uh, preliminary results in terms of the uh, foraminiferal assemblage that we've uh, identified so far. So it was just semi-quantitative uh, uh, results, which we have been uh, characterized and group them in classes as to see which ones are grouped in what a cluster. So just to uh, conclude based on what we've seen so far, well, the sedimentary deposits in these two environments are consistent uh, with the extreme marine wave event deposits. And also the foraminiferal assemblage, and also the uh, typhonomy suggests extreme excursion. Although the Swarkov's core has been dated, however, these results alone they cannot be conclusive about the uh, timing of the event as to when is the event. Uh, de uh, deposited uh, these uh, deposits. But one thing that uh, this foraminiferal assemblage has shown us is the potential of uh, this data set that has in providing a useful interpretation on the uh, extreme wave deposits, such as tsunami and uh, storm surge, because uh, the species that we found in those areas, they are not supposedly to be there. And the level of breakage that we found there, it shows us that uh, they were deposited during extreme marine events, whereas in the Duasquez Force, the level of uh, the corrosion, it shows us that, uh, well, it might not have been due to the extreme marine event alone that resulted to the level of corrosion and fragmented, but uh, there is another factor which is a high acidity that might have played a, a role in uh, the level of preservation. Well, we still await for the radiocarbon dating results so that we can uh, give a proper story as to when these events or these deposits were deposited in these areas. And to just uh, conclude about the 
opportunities uh, this research has, as we continually seek to understand the global climate change and also human activities effect on our marine environments. Well, the foreign feral analysis provide an opportunity to further study environmental change. For example, ecological stress, the environment, they will have a abnormal foraminifera test. Like for instance, these are some of the species that uh, we have seen or that uh, we have uh, identified in uh, uh, these samples. As you could see, they are deformed, uh, which shows us that they were uh, under stress. So this species here, uh, species number one, is the cytoside Labotula that is mostly found in the uh, in a shelf environment. Whereas um, this one on my uh, right hand side, it's the uh, ammonia species that is found um, in uh, estuarine and also in the uh, subtidal environment. You can see here, it is also a stress with some uh, evidence of staining, which I'm not sure whether uh, that is the pollution, but you can see from the both side, it has that uh, dark stain. And also it does not have a uh, umbilical plaque, which shows us that uh, it was uh, also under stress conditions. But because we are dealing with fossils, so we're not too sure whether uh, these, uh, uh, like for instance, in this second um, uh, picture, whether uh, these conditions, uh, they okay before they are dead or after death, but uh, they are very useful in uh, showing us uh, the, uh, the ecologically stress, the environment. Well, um, taking the opportunity of um, these, uh, we are also in one project that we are doing with the colleagues from uh, NMU uh, at Great Brack. So we used uh, foreign feral to see uh, the, at the ecological status of that uh, open closed uh, estuary. So that uh, it will give us an idea whether we can use um, a, a foreign feral uh, to into studies of a uh, ecological uh, uh, monitoring such as um, pollution and also um, climate change. Well, we hope that uh, this is the first step towards incorporating these microorganisms in our long-term ecological uh, research. Well, of course, as I said earlier on, uh, we do need um, the modern data and uh, at these um, uh, microfusels, they need also to be studied together with other proxies such as diatom and the pollen as they have a close relationship especially with diatom uh, so for us to have a better a better understanding of what is happening in our environment so we need to uh, study together with other proxies well i think uh, this is what i was intended to share with you on our for our research. Well, there are many people that I would like to thank in this uh, journey thus far. And I also want to thank you for making time and listening to this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ati. That was very, very interesting. Um, is there any questions? May I ask? There was no question posted in the chat. So we're moving to the live question section. If you have a question, you can just indicate any questions. I don't see anybody. Okay. Thank you, Ati. I think uh, you've got them stumped. Um, uh, obviously, very well delivered 
talk, very, the explanation was very clear. And um, so just to round off for today then, uh, we have two more minutes left, four more minutes, I see. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and attending the seminar. Please make a note that the next seminar will be on the 10th of December and that speakers will be Melissa Smith and Keenan Steers from Google Note discussing the integrating herbivore distribution, assemblages and vegetation structure to reveal optimum strategies for managing biodiversity in the face of global change. Hope to see you all there. Thank you very, very much for attending again. Uh, have a lovely day and a great weekend.